<laughs> Richard Perkins, welcome to the Strategic Tech Coaching Podcast. Thanks so much, Oscar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was on a flight uh, back to Sweden and I sat next to a lady talking about uh, food production and I got really interested in this topic. And unfortunately, I did a podcast episode with her, but I couldn't use it, unfortunately. So, but recently I did some research and I found you, Richard, and you run a farm in Sweden. So maybe first, can you share a little bit about uh, Ridgedale and uh, the farm that you're having in, in Sweden? Sure. So we're a small farm by modern farm standards. It's only 10 hectares, so it's 25 acres for folks in America. That wouldn't be considered a typical farm. Most farms are getting bigger and bigger and powered by debt, oil, and less and less people on the ground, more and more technology, etc. But what we've set out to do is to run a farm that generates a high level of income for us as farmers, producing incredible quality food that you can't buy in stores around here, whilst we're generating the soil and habitat and leaving the land in a better condition than we founded it. Mm. And all of that is running counter to the direction that agriculture in the mainstream is moving. Farms are getting massive, massively debt-based. Young people can't get into farming and old people can't leave farms because all of their capital is locked up in infrastructure that can't be moved. And so we have this generational gap where it's impossible for young people to get in. The farms that exist are based on extracting resources and they only work as businesses because they're subsidized by the government. Mm. And here we are, along with hundreds of our students and many other people around the world, showing that you can make Stockholm wages out in the middle of farmland, <laughs> doing something good for the environment, feeding people great food and having a really meaningful life. Mm. It's hard work, but it's meaningful work and joyful work. And we have a mixed farm. So we produce vegetables, we produce meat chickens, eggs from pastured hens we have sometimes forest raised pigs and we have cattle and sheep just in a small number because mm. of our land base yeah. and through that we can drive surprisingly high revenues and work very hard for six months of the growing season here and have relatively very little to do for four months of the year which allows us a really nice quality of life yeah so there, uh, there's a lot of things i want to talk with you about these things actually but uh, first, let's go, get back a little bit to your background because uh, you don't have a Swedish accent, but you live in, in Sweden. So, <laughs> but uh, what is your background? Like, I know you ended up in Sweden the, in the last couple of years, but how come you got interested in this from the beginning, uh, farming? Well, originally I left home very young. I was 15, 16 years old and left home and had a quite tumultuous time in life. At that time, I had quite a difficult circumstance. And I actually lived with gypsy people, which were, it was a very unusual circumstance and a massive eye-opener to me to live amongst people who still know how to live from the land. And it was a strange mix. So it, it was a mix of Romani people and Irish travelers who are very different in their cultures and traditions, you could say. But they taught me about how to become self-resilient, how to live off the land. And I remember a conversation sitting around with close friends at the time, dreaming up a vision for the future when I was still a tender child, really. And I wanted to buy a farm and I wanted us to live together and work together on that place. And I think for the people I was speaking with, that was a nice idea, but it actually really was growing inside me. So when I was 18, I went to agriculture school and studied organic crop production and horticulture and then since then that was half my life ago now but since then my journey has been working studying and then eventually after a long journey through that leading into consulting and educating others and building up a business there i've run many businesses i think the last job i worked for someone else was perhaps when i was 21 22 and i've run maybe nine or ten different enterprises always in a sort of entrepreneurial spirit but always with the goal to be able to buy land and put my feet down somewhere and coming from england that's very hard to do land access is a major issue here in europe all over europe but 
prices of property in England are astronomical and, and that problem I mentioned earlier, for young people coming in, there's just no way you could secure loans against the property prices that we see nowadays and banks don't seem to appreciate the value of agriculture in that way. And so I actually looked at buying land in Southeast Asia. I lived in Southeast Asia for several years and was working in farming there also and where, had a special where? affinity that where? was in Thailand, in Thailand yeah. mainly. I traveled all over the region but mm. I lived in Thailand for three years. So I looked at buying land there and I looked at land in south of Europe because that's much more affordable. But I actually came to Sweden by happenstance. I came here just to help someone out. And I, I really knew nothing about Sweden. Something that is perhaps unfamiliar to you as a, as a Swede is that further down in Europe, you don't really hear much about Scandinavia at school. Mm. You hear of Denmark when you grow up in England, but it's a place right out over there somewhere you don't know much about. And Norway, Finland, Sweden. It's just it's, Viking. It's not, Bloody Vikings coming for pillaging, no? That's what you hear, no? And maybe it's I'll not so much in the consciousness. It's yeah. not something we learn about the history of in any detail. Yeah. And so I didn't really know anything about the country, but I came here just with the intention of being here for two weeks. And I fell in love and it was summertime and it was beautiful around. And, and the first thing that struck me, I was running an educational training at a small farm like we have today. And nobody was farming. And that really struck me because mm -hmm. where I come from, people will give an arm and a leg to, to just have access to land. And here were people that had land and weren't doing anything with it. Yeah. And big barns and big amount of resources lying around that weren't being utilized. And I found that really shocking. And then I started to see the property prices. This was quite close to Stockholm, about 45 minutes away. And obviously the prices there are much higher than where we bought a farm in Vermland, but still compared to the UK, I mean, you can buy a, a fully ready farm for the price of a garage for parking your car in. So we actually then engaged in a year long trip all over the country looking at properties. And we didn't have a huge amount of money to get started. And we also wanted to reserve money for starting the business because something a lot of people coming into farming do is they, it, they stretch their budget for buying a property too far and then they have no capital to start the business and, and then it grows slowly from there. And I didn't want to do that because we knew we wanted to jump into farming at high production levels pretty quickly. Mm. So... It took a long time to find a farm because we were getting outbid because the properties that we were looking at wouldn't be considered agricultural units in typical standards today. And so they would be seen as like a holiday home and the people would rip down the old house, build a fancy new house and just cut the pastures once a year mm. to keep the land open. So we yeah. would often get outbid by people from Stockholm, et cetera. And it was a very interesting process because we would go to look at these properties and I would just, I wouldn't even look at the house. I'd be going around looking at the land and, and planning the farm. And then someone would come and say, oh, the house is cute. And they would just triple the price of it straight away. <laughs> so yeah. we ended up over in Vermland and my partner is, she was based around Stockholm. She grew yeah. up in Peru and uh, the Congo and came to Sweden when she was in her teenage years, but she had established friends and family around Stockholm. So I really let her guide that process because I didn't have any connection to the country. Mm. So I didn't really mind where I ended up. And I knew that we would be bringing a lot of international people to the farm with the activities we were doing. So I felt like I could bring some element of social and community life to me. And so she was happy to move out here and we could afford the farm. And yeah, that's where we ended up in yeah. the middle of the dark forest of Vermland. Yeah. I guess this is the, I mean, if you want to have a lower property prices, you need to go further away from the big cities, which also, I guess, is a challenge because I can't buy your eggs in Stockholm. But yeah, that's a future, future topic, like a later topic. Uh, but first... Um, did, what's the definition for people that are not into these things? What's the definitions of a regenerative farm versus like a sustainable farm or organic farm? Like, what is the difference between these uh, terms? Mm. Well, it's a good question. It needs a bit of unpacking. I mean, 
for me, the word sustainable is, is totally incorrect and outdated. It sounds like treading water. It sounds like staying still and an idea of stasis. And like, think of your marriage. Like, do you want a sustainable marriage? You know, does that sound like <laughs> no. something you'd endure? You know, like, how's your relationship? Oh, sustainable. It, it doesn't sound very inspiring, does it? Yeah, no, it. <laughs> and you want it to be getting better and the connection deeper and the resilience in, in that partnership to be getting better over time. And that's exactly how we need to approach ecosystems. The type of farming we do is observing how natural patterns work so we can go back and study how nature did herbivores, large herds of bison when Europeans first went to America. We can look at ecology of forest systems and apply them to our production techniques because most of our modern agricultural science has come from very linear compartmentalized reductionist thinking asking like the right questions in the wrong place studying damaged agricultural land that had been plowed for 10,000 years rather than going to the wild parts of nature and studying how soil functions when it hasn't been damaged by the plow for example mm -hmm. and those little things add up to the sort of main agricultural approach we see today which is based on asking a lot of good questions but in the wrong place as it were mm -hmm. and so you've had different branches of agriculture trying to address these problems with soil degradation habitat loss etc but sustainable farming is not good enough because we're in a position where even in organic agriculture today it's acceptable to have a certain percentage of soil loss, for example. But every time you see a farmer plowing through a field and the soil is blowing away as they go over with a machine to prepare for the seeding or whatever, you see soil blowing off across the road. Every millimeter of topsoil is 10 tons of soil per hectare. And actually you eat about 450 kilos of food every year, but agriculture's destroying 10 tons of soil for you to get that food. And if you look back at history, every culture that damaged its soil is now extinct. And we're moving soil around faster and faster than we ever have. In fact, we move more soil through agriculture every year now than the last ice age moved in its entirety. And when you really step back and think about that, it's like humans have become a geological event. <laughs> on the earth. Yeah. And so that's pretty catastrophic. So we're asking the question, well, what does it look like to make our land better than it's ever been before? And what would it be like to produce better food than you can buy, even in the top restaurants in this country? And what would it be like to earn the money we deserve for working hard and, and producing that resource? Mm. So it's all based around building soil and building habitat. And an important technical part of that is capturing carbon. So we hear a lot of today about the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and people are starting to look at things like carbon taxation and there's lots of things online about stopping flying we need to burn less fossil fuels but people don't really know that there is more carbon in the atmosphere from soil damage than from all of fossil fuel use combined and what it where it used to be were in the large expanses of the world's grasslands which cover about 60 percent of the world's surface that are now desertified through taking away livestock. Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of poor science and misunderstandings and then combine that with today's social media meme style thinking where it's seemingly people's attention span is just a few minutes and it's very easy to post arguments like meat production bad, vegetable production good, which in, in, in its essence is true of modern industrial agriculture but in fact in regenerative agriculture it's totally the opposite there's nothing all, more sustainable you need, you need them together everything needs to work together as a system right and... that's part of it but in fact there's nothing more regenerative than turning sunlight to grass to flesh hmm. and so eating grass-fed beef properly raised meat is actually fundamental to human survival on the planet because most of the world's surface is or was grassland 
things mm. like vegetable production is very hard to even make sustainable because it relies on all the inputs from someone else's animals to keep it thriving. Mm. So a big part of our job is, is really working intensively to manage our landscape. And, and you can see we've documented our journey on YouTube that's really transformed our landscape to some of the most productive land. Well, mm. it's one of the most productive small farms in Europe. Yeah. Per unit produced per area in a very short growing season in a heavily taxed and highly regulated country. So yeah. our premise has been if you can do that here, you can do this everywhere. And in fact, there are people all over the globe in all climate zones doing this kind of work. How many farms like this do you think exist around the world? Thousands. I mean, personally, we have hundreds of students doing this kind of work just around Europe. In fact, this summer I had actually planned to be away from the farm for the first time. I'd have mm. the first extended break from the farm to actually tour around the whole of Europe, filming and documenting what our students have been up to. So this farm's had two functions. One is to produce amazing food and we build salt and function as a model for how agriculture could look with the idea that rather than one huge factory farm surrounding a town, we could have hundreds of small farms like this providing people's food needs locally whilst connecting people and educating people about their food yeah. and wider topics around that. Um, and I couldn't go with the COVID situation, obviously, yeah. but I've been conducting interviews, which I'll be running through till November. We've set up a, a site called Farm Like a Hero, and that's a mm. massive uh, outpouring of hundreds of hours of content we're creating this summer to share all the unsung heroes of this type of farming who don't necessarily have a spotlight on them mm -hmm. and That's... don't have a, a big social media following or whatever. But okay. just from our own bank of students, we have hundreds of people running extremely lean and efficient and profitable businesses based on the work here and, and through other pioneers in the field. Interesting. Uh, just a side note, how is the social distancing in Vermeer? <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess you know, growing up as a Swede, that Swedes are pretty well known for social distancing anyway. Yeah. And there's a lot of space in Vermeer. <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, yeah. No, but our, our lives haven't changed at all. That's yeah, the yeah, interesting thing is that yeah. all the producers I'm speaking to we're seeing our sales double or triple. People are getting more and more interest. Yeah. We live outdoors in a healthy environment that it's changed our life in no way whatsoever. So yeah, that's yeah. quite interesting too. Yeah, it's yeah. like our life is completely as normal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, see, uh, my internet's a little bit bad. Okay. Uh, yeah. Th so I wanted to check out something. I looked at the prices of eggs here in Dubai, and there are, just on a website, there were four different categories of eggs. You had the local eggs, and they were about 0 0.15 euros for one egg. And then you had Omega-3 local eggs. They were 0 0.34 euros. You had free range from Ireland. It was 0 0.45 euros. Omega-3, free, free range from Ireland, 0 0.46. And then the organic Irish was 0 0.57 euros, which is about six kroners. So from the cheapest egg to the most expensive egg, there's a price difference, 3.8 higher price with the organic eggs. So if you look at those categories, what do you think is different in the production of those eggs that cost almost nothing to those expensive eggs that are very expensive? Well... Let's unpack that because there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So eggs have always been very cheap. If you, you think about what's in an egg, they're extremely cheap source of protein and they always have been. And they've also got a lot of stigma around them. Certainly where I grew up in the UK, if you put the egg price up by 50%, there'd be a national riot. It's like you, there's certain products that you can't, mess with the price because it's become a benchmark of people's family shopping or you know how they measure economic things and eggs are a really important product like that but what you see with the industrial produced eggs there is you have massive externalized health and safety concerns that are not factored into that economy 
So probably those cheap eggs come from one huge barn where the chickens are raised in totally inhumane conditions. Probably the workers work in inhumane conditions. They are probably basically slave labor from some other part of the Middle East or Africa, I would yeah, guess. Or India. I yeah. doubt anyone would let a film crew in there yeah. and it, or would interview you about their production, mm. you know. And they're based on totally imported grain, probably genetically modified, off a huge land base that's desertifying from poor agricultural practice. And there's a massive waste pollution problem that's got to be dealt with by a whole nother industry down the line. So they have economies of scale where those eggs are cheap, but you've got a huge medieval village essentially kept alive by a pharmaceutical industry. And that's passed on to the consumer who gets nutrient deficient eggs, probably run off of drugs in their drinking water supply and from the manure etc and it only works because it's based on an extremely underpaid or or virtually slave labor labor market you know we've all seen you know certain things in the middle east and not run in very ethical way at all when you open the doors back a bit right. so you're trying to compare that to like in our farm for example we have small flocks of hens they live in mobile homes of a few hundred birds in each, say 400 birds in each, and every single day they're moved to a new patch of grass. They're always on grass, and they eat a lot of that green material and a lot of insects. That's what a chicken does, spends all its days doing Coffee. scratching with its yeah. feet and finding insects. We feed organic feed, so we do bring organic feeds in, but we buy grain from a local farmer who's close to us, and the quality of the eggs is just unreal i mean there's been a lot of scientific documentation of this levels of omega acids levels of proteins beta carotenes all of these different things this is well documented over the last 40 years but even what i'm doing is a million miles away from those organic eggs and and this is what the consumer doesn't see perhaps is Organic free range eggs, well, free range is not necessarily good for a chicken either. If you go on Google Earth, for example, and you zoom down and look at a free range farm, they have a big house. They're still kept in industrial conditions typically, which is causing massive stress to the birds because chickens didn't evolve to live in huge flocks like that. And they have a social order and hierarchy, so that messes with that. They're kept without males, that also stresses their social system. But what you see is that they never really, so the image to the customer, right, is this sun going down, the grass is waving, the chickens are outside, happy I think chickens it's even on must the box, be good eggs. On the, on the cart. Exactly. <laughs> and what happens, cons and the egg box is green and the consumer oh, wow. just turns brain off, keeps consuming. But, but when you really look at those farms, there's big paddocks of grass and then around the barn is just mud because they don't go very far from their home because it's not safe for them because of predators, etc. So that idea of free range is good for humans, not for chickens. Mm. Animals in nature work with what's called time controlled grazing. All animals are on the move because for hygiene and safety region, reasons and to find food, obviously. So that's how we run ours. So our eggs are, are not even comparable to free range or organic eggs. And so we actually sell our eggs at 4.4 crowns. So our so eggs are in less, the yeah. middle of that run. Mm, mm. And we have absolutely exceptional quality of welfare. And when we have inspections by yeah. the uh, welfare people in Sweden, they absolutely love it because yeah. the rest of their job is going around looking at horrible industrial conditions where they have to put a hazmat that suit on and wear a mask and we have this beautiful picture that we're happy to film and put it on youtube a to share that with others of how we do that but b that's our marketing mm. like here are genuinely well cared for hens that translates to very high quality eggs yeah. and this is the same across the board with all the productions we have at the farm like we're mimicking how nature does it
Yeah. And that's the way to build the landscape up and build products that are actually good for human health. I understand that eggs was a big source of, of income for you guys, so, right? Uh, yeah, uh, we have three primary enterprises on the farm. So we do pastured eggs. So these are laying hens specifically producing eggs at high levels of production. We have meat chickens and some turkeys, which are less common in Sweden. So we do a lot of meat chickens, which we slaughter in our home-built mm. slaughtery on the farm. So we have one of the cheapest regulated slaughter facilities in Sweden, in Europe, in fact. And that's an inspected approved space mm. that means we can keep the nutrient cycle on the farm. And we also earn the money for the work we do rather than some middle person mm. taking all of the profit mm. away because so we can make this mind. small, yeah. yeah, we can make small farms work, but we need to cut out all middle people in mm. the chain of production. Yeah. Yeah. Our third enterprise is growing vegetables. Mm. And I just want to follow on from that and say like the, the, the way we can do that by cutting out the middleman is we sell direct to consumers and we build relationships. So this type of farming really works with relationship marketing. Mm. And that for me is the basis of food security is when I meet you on a weekly basis and you pick up a vegetable basket and eggs and a meat chicken or some pork or beef and we look at each other. We don't have to meet for long to know like, yeah, cool, I appreciate mm. what you do. Yeah, you enjoyed that. How was last week? Yeah, good. That's food security. Mm. You know, and that's yeah. a, an increasing issue that people are becoming aware of is we have very small supplies of food in the country at any time, particularly here in Sweden, where we import most things. We export a lot of things that we could be eating. Mm. But the quality of food in Sweden has shocked me. Coming from Europe, where there's a lot more culture around cuisine, mm. I've been blown away by how poor the quality of the food is in the stores in Sweden, given it's such an affluent nation. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are starved for good food. And, and we've seen farms like ours copying what we're doing essentially, and many other pioneers are doing, and it's spreading now finally in Sweden too. Mm -hmm. Some of the yeah. ideas are a bit older in other parts of Europe, okay. but it's really spreading here too. And the demand is, is huge. Yeah. I mean, I think it's amazing if you can buy straight for, straight from the farm, uh, you know, no middleman is good for everyone, you know. So um, you, I saw on your website that you are not, you're not using the org organic labors. Uh, just the backstory, my, my father is uh, always saying that these organic labels is just a marketing scam for, to, to make money. Uh, so he doesn't like to buy organic. Me and my wife, we try to buy organic here in Dubai. There's an organic shop that is doing quite well. But I understand that. So a little bit about the organic labels. In Sweden, we have Krav, and then I think in Europe, there are different standards. And your decision not to be part of the, these organic labels. Mm. Well, I frankly uphold the idea of organics, but I wish to go far beyond organic. And that's partly how we market is beyond organic. So even organic productions still allow broad spectrum herbicides of some kinds that are less damaging than perhaps the, the conventional pesticides and herbicides, but they're still broad spectrum poisons that aren't good for soil life. But as a farmer, I'm a microbe farmer, essentially. I'm managing microbes in the soil because that's my basis that I'm managing to create all the wealth that I create. And modern farming has become the job of technicians who sit in machines, connected to computers who have no real connection to the land base and habitat that they are working with. We're managing the ground from the microbes up and vegetables and beef or chicken are the byproduct of that. And if you're building soil, you're probably making money. If you're degrading soil and losing it every year through flooding or flying away through the wind or whatever, you're probably subsidized by the government and your business is poor. And so, we do things organically, but we go 10 steps further than that. And there is a lot of greenwashing in, in organics. Like the way I always simplify this for, for lay people is if you can buy this in a supermarket, then it's produced at a scale where caring for the soil and the habitats and local people is nothing to do with their decision making. Mm. Now, it's better than GMO heavily sprayed glyphosate laden food of course it's better but it's not good enough 
And so what we're trying to do is take a lot more responsibility. Mm. And a long-term view on that is what's happening in Sweden, most countries in Europe is farmers are averaging 65 years of age and they tell their kids, don't go into farming. It's rubbish, bad business, not going to work. Go to the city, get a real job. Mm. And that's tragic because these are kids that grow up with skills that you do not get if you grow up in the city. Yeah. How to fix a tractor when you're eight, you know, how to use tools and machinery safely, etc. And this is tragic because we will lose an unbelievable amount of knowledge in a generation or two. Mm. So how do I convince other people to go into farming? How do I get my kids to go into it? Well, I have to leave my farm better than it was. I have to have a functioning business with happy returning customers and enough money that it looks inspiring for them, et cetera. You see what I mean? So, yeah. so we're looking to go way beyond what's required of us. We're doing this with a triple bottom line, which is it must rebuild the ecology. It must be sustainable financially and it must be good for the customer. And yeah. if all those things are managed towards, then we're going to, if everyone's winning, we'll keep playing, you know, and that's mm. good business for me. So we're trying to really show that good business must take those three things into account equally. Mm. And running a business based purely on the bottom line is, is a model of yesteryear that it needs to go because mm. we can't treat our finite resources in the way we've been doing and expect to continue as a global civilization for many yeah. more generations. So if you go to, to like these big factory farming uh, that uh, I think most people in Sweden and Europe buy their food from, uh, what, what are the biggest problems that you see with these factory farms? I think you, can ha you, have, I think you have a long list. <laughs> but, uh, let's go like top three. You know, like. Well, obviously it's different factory farms, but that goes for all the animals people eat, eggs, right? And even a lot of vegetables. So you've got massive input output equations going on you're using very large amounts of debt-based infrastructure you're using large amounts of oil to heat buildings for inappropriate species or whatever it is growing tomatoes in sweden in winter you know it's like when you really do a cost analysis of that it's totally crazy but you've got as we said before animals kept in totally inhumane conditions Animals are not evolved to stand on concrete all day. You know, it's bad for their feet, it's bad for their legs. That means you need drugs to keep them healthy. Or they're living in their fecal waste, like chickens and pigs, where they're breathing in fecal pathogens constantly. That means the, certainly the softer linings of the respiratory system are damaged. And then again, you need that drug industry. And, and People don't get to see that side of it. Maybe that nowadays it's easy to find videos of factory farm conditions, but nobody likes to really ask deeper questions about that. Or, you know, people like to turn a blind eye, but the pharmaceutical industry behind that is like, if you really understand the scale of that business and how much money is moving through there, it's unbelievable. And then as an output, you've got poor food products. So when you feed, a great example would be, how do we raise beef today? Well, we love to feed beef lots of grain. So we use prime agricultural land to grow grain that would be fit for human consumption. And then we feed it to animals at a very po poor rate of conversion to produce more beef per unit. But that beef has got totally out of balance omega-3 and 6 ratios which means humans get sick from it. So mm. look at all cause mortalities, obesity, heart disease, cancers, right? They've all skyrocketed since humans started eating very concentrated grains and animals and dairy fed on concentrated grains. Mm. But think about a cow, a cow never evolved to eat any grains at all. It it's eats special stomach. Yeah. yeah, they've got a highly evolved stomach, especially for eating grass and they only need to eat grass and forks they don't need grains at all mm. so we get these false economies where yeah i can stuff that cow full of grain and i'll get more beef and therefore it's more profit for me but if you look at the overall cost of the pharmaceutical industry and the waste of oil in the production let alone then 
you know, you could break this down on many levels. Look at the global distribution of that product or shipping that beef 400 kilometers across Sweden to get it slaughtered and packed mm. and shipping it all the way around the country. It doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. And then on the other end of that, the consumer gets food that's not nutritionally dense, it's not balanced in the way that we're evolved to eat it. And then we've got the whole knock on effect for our whole medical system through poor lifestyle and diet choice, etc. Yeah. So when you really take all that into the picture, it's like there's a lot wrong with factory farming. But it's not yeah. just factory farming. It's that same level of thinking that goes on in our educational institutions. It goes on in our economic and political systems. It's all tied together and married so tightly that it's not easy to address any one part of that without addressing all of those things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my, my wife has uh, her roots in Japan. And uh, a couple of years ago, we went to Japan to visit her sister. And then, uh, like one week after, I flew to US to Houston, uh, Texas. And in Japan, everyone is uh, skinny, fit, uh, healthy. Uh, the older people are all uh, like super fit. And in Houston, in Texas, not really. <laughs> Let's say there's a lot of like obese and a lo lot of um, uh, people that are overweight. And I, I was thinking always that it was the diet that the Japanese are eating, but I'm also starting to think that maybe it's something with the food production. Do, do you think that's, that could be a source of the problem as well? It's both those things. I mean, partly also it's lifestyle choices, right? But it's food production and it's like it's the actual diet and the way it's produced. I mean, the classic food pyramid in America where, you know, it's heavily carb-based and it's highly refined sugar and flowers. I and mean, humans mm. did not evolve to eat those things at all. Mm. And that food pyramid, some would argue, is totally upside down. You know, lots Have more fat and South, proteins. South Park ep episode? There's a South Park episode when they discovered that they should turn it upside down. I don't know if you've seen that. No, it's... but there's maybe more truth to that yeah. than people. Like, people might see that and think of it as a joke, but there's a lot of truth. And there's a lot of people exploring that where, like, eating fats and meats and all these things we grew up being told we shouldn't eat too much of, they don't make you fat. They don't make you unhealthy. I eat huge amounts of grass-fed beef and forest-raised pork, lots of lard, lots of butter, lots of dairy, and I'm slim and fit and healthy. So the reason Americans are getting fat is because they're eating a lot of sugar and processed carbs, and that will kill anyone. They've got yeah. incredible rates of all-cause mortalities. That's from wrong diet and you could probably add a portion of badly produced onto that. I don't know how that, you know, I don't know if you ate organic refined flour and sugar, it would, of course, it would cause the same results. So it's mainly diet and lifestyle choices, but the way it's produced also has knock on effects with hormonal imbalances and residual yeah. toxins from heavy metals in, in, sprays yeah. and chemicals that are used in farming etc but uh, i have another thing that uh, another time i went to us uh, we went to reno and then we took the, the greyhound bus from reno to san francisco and we were traveling around in like a lot of like rough neighborhoods and there was a lot of overweight people and in san francisco i stayed uh, with some friends in a really nice like suburban uh, big house uh, and they took me to a lake we went for a walk and everyone like a lot of people were walking around that lake in that neighborhood everyone was fit fit and slim and healthy. So it also seems to be like uh, almost becoming a class thing because the cheapest thing you can eat in, in Dubai is a McDonald's. That, that's the, mm. the, like, it's, I mean, like I said, the organic egg is uh, 3.8 times more expensive. So, so I don't want it to become a class thing as well that only the people with money can afford the good sourced food. So what, how do you solve this problem? I guess you're working on it. Right? What, what well, do you do? I'm not... It's not necessarily my job to solve that. And it's a difficult one, of course. But look, I live next door to a multimillionaire who drives to Picos to buy the cheapest crap he can buy. And he could afford to eat anything he wants. So tell me what's going on there. Yeah. I, I don't have a lot of money, but I have everything I need. And I eat like a king. Like mm. there's not a person in this country that can eat as well as I do. And it's all from a few meters outside my back door. You know, and I have a whole human diet on this farm. 
So I feel very safe and secure. And, and I often think about these things. I, of course, it, true poverty will lead people to eating cheap processed food and that will make them sick, which unfortunately costs a lot more in the long run if you do that whole cost analysis. Mm, yeah, yeah. But why do people make those choices? I think lack of education and massive mm. propaganda from companies like Coca-Cola. All these companies are essentially selling empty carbs at massive profit margins and getting people addicted to high sugar, high carb. You know, it's an, yeah. it's an addiction. Yeah. It's addictive stuff. And so it's a long journey to reprogram things. But I think nowadays more and more media is coming out about these things. And a lot more people are exposed to the problems of sugar and refined mm. yeah. grains, etc. But I don't think it's going to happen quickly. I think the quickest thing that's going to happen is grain production is going to become harder and harder to maintain because most grain is happening in continental interiors, which are some of the regions of the world most heavily impacted by the changing climate. And for farming, the changing climate is the most pronounced because it's not that the temperature is getting hotter here or cooler there, it's that the weather patterns are changing, which makes crop production very unpredictable and complete failures become normal. That happened not so many years ago with Russian grain production, which is a hugely significant portion of world grain production. And it changed global stock prices absolutely unprecedentedly. So as soon as you have massive catastrophic failures in the interior of the US, in the grain producing areas or in Russia, etc., you will start to, to see bigger shifts there in the global markets. And it's the same with sugar, like the sugar industry is dying as well. You know, that's been slave labor ever since Europeans first went to South America, Central America. It's still run like that today in the majority of cases. And it's often in, set up through trade agreements. Certainly the Americans, are, you know, the main importers of sugar are, are setting up trade deals where producers have to sell sugar at lower than the cost of production to companies like McDonald's, Coca-Cola, etc. But all that system seems to be breaking apart more and more rapidly that, you know, it'll take maybe a generation to change those deeply ingrained habits. But, you know, just the extent of that is if you go to any supermarket anywhere, but here in Sweden, for example, 95% of every single product in that store is mainly made up of one of four grain crops. You know, it's the majority of what everyone is eating. So to change that in a, in a global way is, you know, who has the answer for that? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but this is one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you as well to 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 share this information because I think we need to we need to change this when uh, the cost is too high. So, um, uh, so that that's why I was I wanted to reach out to you. Um, the, in the conspiracy circles, let's say there's, there's a lot of talks about Monsanto and GMOs, and uh, that Monsanto is the most evil company in the world. And all this. What are, what are your thoughts on GMOs? Well, I doubt they have. A holistic bottom line. They're not there for anything other than the benefit of their shareholders. They are not producing chemicals and seeds for the benefit of people. Mm. That's to make money, pretty yeah. clear to me. Yeah. It's of course it's a massive global corporation, and of course they're based on their triple bottom line. Mm. Those companies are, you know, the there's many Syngenta, etc. Like Yes, these are not good companies and they're, they're not good because their holistic context, the context within which they make decisions is not broad enough. Because that vision that they're supporting is no people left in agriculture, machines and automation on mass scale based on plow based and chemical agriculture, which produces habitats that don't function water cycles that don't work you know we're in a situation where something like seven out of the ten biggest rivers on earth don't flow to the sea year round anymore Zzz, back up a minute like what seven of the biggest rivers on earth don't flow to the sea year round anymore why because of agriculture 
right? So that vision of agriculture, we know where that goes. It leads to severe extinction of wildlife species and habitat, and it leads to rapid soil degradation that causes rapid, and, and increasingly so, produces rapid floods and erosion that leads to silting up of river systems and coral reef and marine systems. The knock-on effects are, are huge. Mm. So when you produce terminator seeds or hybrid seeds where the farmer can't save his own seed and tailor it to his specific climatic conditions, then you're locked into this corporate system mm. that's only looking to get bigger and more pervasive. And that I don't like where that leads because that's not, looking it's not the world i want my grandkids to grow up in yeah you know so, so as a consumer, and to speak to that to i'd like to just speak to that briefly about the what we're doing here and why that is different is that what we're seeing on our farm is like when i first moved to sweden seven years ago i didn't hear any songbirds i didn't hear any little birds mm. and I noticed that massively because I grew up in England where there was huge amounts of garden birds in, you know, in, mm. in people's back gardens. We have seen all kinds of species on this farm. We've got wolves passing through our farm. I've seen a beaver here. We have masses of birds coming back. And we have now three pairs of birds of prey who actually nest and breed on our farm. And that's mind blowing to me because we're a tiny little farm, but we've become like an island that creatures want to come back to because it's not just monoculture spruce or a sprayed empty field. What happens in ecology is when you bring an animal to an area, it creates the niche conditions for many other animals to come and live there too. And we've brought so many different types of animal to the farm that life is really coming back here and it's distinctly different from all the landscape around us both in terms of the things that grow naturally here and the animals that come passing through and so that's more you know it's a complete opposite direction than industrial agriculture is heading it's like our soils are getting better and better we've put out videos and documented in our book we've grown 25 centimeters of topsoil across our land while we've been here in a very short time. Whereas mm. modern agronomists would say that's impossible, we can't do that, it takes a thousand years to grow a millimeter of soil. But it's here and working and we've documented it and we're showing many other people how to do the same. So I'd say my vision for the future is based on, on that holistic triple bottom line of it must be good for local people and mm. it must be good for this landscape and to do that, we must make a good living, or why would we bother doing that? Yeah. And, and that's, that's uh, not something a big company like Monsanto or Syngenta mm. is going to be able to support. Yeah. Just a side, side note, doesn't the wolf and the, the prey birds uh, eat your chickens? Or, or doesn't, they don't come and take no, your... No, No? Wolves uh, are obviously very... Like wolves are much more scared, but we have people on our land and people leave mm. scents. So mm. wolves don't really want to mm. come close to people. And you, and have a, you have a tiger as well. Rang Say again? You have a tiger as well. <laughs> <laughs> Your son no, likes well, we have a lot of foxes and we have aerial predators like hawks, etc. But I think there's something to be said for good quality mobile infrastructure. So we use portable electric fences around all our animals and that's partly to keep them in the area we plan them to be because we're moving them every day. And it's partly to protect them from predators. And so we never mm. lose animals to predators. We have the whole farm surrounded by wolf fence. So mm. that allows us to protect the whole farm. And then within that, all the animals are protected by portable electric fences that are pick, we're quick to pick up and move on a day-to-day -day basis as we move the animals. Mm. And those fences are very low cost, a couple of hundred euros, and you can fence in 400 chickens on a small plot and keep them moving on a day-to-day -day basis. But those nets, are, they're powered by a little solar panel energizer, and that's enough to keep away a bear, yeah. a wolf, yeah. fox, etc. Okay. Um, for a consumer in a, a big city, like Stockholm or any big city in Europe, what, what, what should they think about when they go to the supermarket? Uh, I guess the best is to find a local farmer, but um, just are resources you can share where they can do that or? 
Yeah, there is. And I really urge consumers to really, you know, obviously we all live busy lives and people need to just have a convenient way to manage their kids and work and food shopping and all the rest too. And I understand that, but it is down to people to make the decisions that will support the future they want for themselves and kids too, because actually it's up to consumers what type of food is produced. If you go and buy crap, cheap food you're supporting in those companies with their context of making decisions and the impacts that that's going to have you know and so it's it's really about taking responsibility and going back to a point you said earlier about the cost of food it's like well when you buy that egg from us you're buying it at the actual cost of that egg that's taking into account the salaries the feed and we deal with all our own waste etc on the farm in fact we don't have waste it's a resource to build our land so that's the price of an egg so you need to change the way you think about it because if you're buying cheaper eggs it's it's because someone else is paying a cost mm. somewhere downstream right yeah so we need to readdress the notion of what food actually costs because just 50 years ago people spent three or four times the amount as a percentage of their income on food. And now people say, well, that's expensive, but they have the latest iPhone, the latest iPad. So it's about priority. Like, what are you prioritizing? You know, mm. I've always prioritized eating exceptional food, even when I've had very little money and couldn't afford to have an, a phone, like a modern phone or whatever, when I was young, you know? So mm. it's about priority. That's up to people to choose. But one thing I could say is that here in Sweden, people are blessed by what's called the RICO movement. And we've been big proponents of that. And what RICO is, is a Facebook driven direct farmer to consumer buying club. And it's like an online farmer's market, you could say. And just to speak of, like, it came out of Finland. And I, there's videos on our YouTube about this, and I've written about it a lot. But basically, I can say, right, I've got eggs and vegetables for sale. And I go and find a baker and a farmer that does beef. And we get together and we turn up at Thursdays at five o'clock in a car park somewhere in the city. And all the producers list what they've got for sale and how much it is for that week. And then consumers make a contract by saying, yeah, I'll have 30 eggs and two bags of vegetables, please. And that creates the contract. And that means it's pre-sold. And that means that gets around trading laws. It's not a market. Right? Mm. So we turn up in a car park and in 30 minutes flat, we drop off 5,000 euros mm. of products. So it's very efficient for a farmer because this has been a weak link for farmers. Is typically they're not very good at communicating when mm. don't like people. <laughs> That's why they, <laughs> they started farming. Yeah, yeah. But the skills for farming today are very different. It's yeah. like you need to know how to use social media and you need to know how to communicate because the power of direct marketing is that you actually get paid properly for the work you did. And so this RECO model, that's R-E-K-O, just for people that are interested in that, that's spread throughout Scandinavia like wildfire. Now we're in a very remote place. We sell only within 50 kilometers of the farm. As a personal limitation, we put ourselves because we think, well, we don't need to sell over to Stockholm. We need to train up 10 people and they go set up a farm near Stockholm mm. and deal mm. with that. Yeah. And let's have many more little farms supplying each town. But for the Rico ring that we have in Karlstad, so Karlstad's a town of about 75,000 people. We have 10,000 people who have gone and joined that Facebook Rico ring. Wow. So one in seven people in that entire town has gone and joined this group. And we nice. sell nearly all our products through that now. We used to sell a lot more to restaurants, but we prefer selling direct to consumers because it's easier to manage. That's and really so nice. that Rico ring is a really balanced ring. So there's vegetables, eggs, all kinds of meats, bread, dairies, flowers, even now some homemade cosmetics made organically with bee wax and honey producers, mm. etc. So you can literally turn up and buy your entire food supply from local integrity farmers who really care about the whole of the picture. 
That's great. And so if it's amazing. And that's spreading now. We've put a lot of effort into helping spread this because it's been out in Scandinavia for some years now. But I think there's like 600 of these Rico rings just in Sweden. So if you live in Stockholm, there's probably 10, 12 of these rings in different parts of Sweden where you can connect to up to 40 different farmers who are growing mm. all kinds of products. So it's very easy and convenient. People tend to do it in places where people are leaving work at the time they're leaving work. Mm. So they're often a lot of thoughts gone into making them at a convenient time and place. And that's a way that you can get to know and support your local farmers. And what's more is that all the people that do farm in this kind of way are pretty interesting people. And they often mm. create, like we run open days. So out here in the middle of Ermland, we have open days that are free for the public. We'll spend all day educating them, showing them around, entertaining kids, feeding them. And that's obviously part of our marketing and community mm. building but it's an important time for kids and people to see and hear about what goes into food production and why it's important and we have hundreds of people show up for that day even here mm. in the middle of Vermland. Yeah, and yeah. people come every year because they love it so and that's something you can you know if your farmer is not willing to let you come and see the farm then you've got to ask why because mm. you know anyone farming with integrity will be willing to show you around yeah. what's going on yeah that's great uh, there's a organic farm in dubai outside dubai called ebf and they have the same thing we were there a couple of months ago and they had kids parties it was full of kids and they, they were playing with the sheep and they, i mean they loved it you mm-hmm. know? i think it's a great way also a good way maybe for the farmers to get some get some extra income uh, uh, so for the entrepreneurial part if um, we had a lot of entrepreneurs are listening to this and if you are an entrepreneur do you think anyone can start a farm like this if even if you have if you're a city boy or if you or do you need i think anyone that's got certain character traits of discipline commitment and that sort of bright-eyed bushy-tailed go get it done attitude Mm. could succeed and what i usually recommend to people is that you spend a season studying and working with someone doing the very thing you want to do Mm. a lot of people are starting up just by watching youtube and reading but you will still save time by taking some expert training because Mm. there's a lot of nuanced details in how these things work because it's management intensive right whereas modern agriculture school is is technical things how Mm. much of this chemical to put in this machine and how to fix this machine when it breaks. We're working with life. We're working with ecosystem processes that are complex and changing on their own. So we need to observe very closely. And so it's very important to take some mentorship from someone who's further ahead of you. However, saying that, I believe this type of farming relies on people who are not from a farming background. Because what happens if you see what goes on in agricultural schools is blinkered and all the sort of pioneering approaches that we brought to Scandinavia, you don't learn about these in agricultural school. Any public institution is behind the times because it's governed by public opinion. And Mm -hmm. so the leading edge of, of any industry is not happening in the universities. And that's a simple fact. Mm -hmm. Innovators out in their field on a limb, trying it out to to fix some of their own problems is where innovation begins and nearly all the best farmers in the world didn't go to agriculture Mm. school at all Mm. Mm. so that says something so i really believe in that and a lot of my educational work is focused on people from an urban or city environment who have decided they don't like living in that crowded way and they want to do something meaningful because they haven't been able to find work that's fulfilling on a deep Mm. level for them and yes, it's possible, but it is hard work for sure. We can do it smart, we can do it clever, but it's hard physical work at times. But this summer, the tour that I mentioned, I'm talking with over a hundred farmers who, like just this week I've spoken to three people who have, I'll give you an example economically. I just spoke to a young couple who are renting land for 500 euros a year and they, invested 10,000 euros to start up. It's a vegetable farm. 
they have 10,000 year running costs and they're now in their second eight month season. So they get four months holiday totally off. Mm. Second eight month season, they're turning over 100,000 euros, 71% of that is profit. Mm -hmm. So what other industry can you go start a business with 20,000 euros and be making that level of profit and pay whilst working for yourself outdoors, doing something meaningful to customers who are very grateful for what you've produced. Mm. You know, this is a meaningful life. And there's so many examples of this happening all over now. Yeah. So and you can eat your yeah. own produce as well, no? Yes, of course. Yeah. Like when you did get to eat all the spoils. When did, when did you go to Ica last time? Well, we do buy some whole foods yeah. because we are supplying a lot of meals here. So we buy in bulk feed ah, okay. like grains and things but we don't buy it from Ica we buy it from organic wholesalers <laughs> <Of course>. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, some if you want to find more about uh, you can go to the YouTube channel which is would you search for Richard Perkins or Richard Farm? yeah that's a like uh, if you search for me on YouTube that's a good insight like I've never focused on making professional YouTube videos I've tried to document our journey to really give a lot of technical information to people that want to do this yeah. so I've never tried to make click baby videos and and make snazzy things I'm just taking you on a journey with me in the stuff we're doing yeah. and why we're doing it so it's a lot of technical information so it's 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 good yeah. if you're interested in that kind of thing I also wrote a book called Regenerative Agriculture, which is a sort of defining text of what this field is about. That's available on our website. You can find that through ridgedalepermaculture.com or through richardperkins.co. And we do a lot of online educational things for young farmers too, but it's all very technical stuff. Mm. So it's... Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I was looking at some of the videos and it was quite technical for me. But uh, I can recommend everyone to watch the farm tour with Ragnar, your son. Uh, he was dressed as a tiger, but uh, it was very nice <laughs> <laughs> to get an overview of the farm. And my wife loved it. She was also amazingly cute. Um, we are at the end of the episode. Do, we, do you have time for two more questions? Or you, I know you're sure. a busy man. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a friend. He has an indoor uh, vertical farm in outside or close to Skövde. Uh, this seems to be a lot of talks about that this will be the way the food production will be indoor farms uh, with lamps that you can go 24 hours and um, maybe a lot of robotic system also in the future. What are your thoughts on these vertical farms, uh, indoor farms? Well, I know what food I'd rather eat, whether it's grown in my vegetable garden or in that system. I mean, I wouldn't eat it and I would never choose to eat it, but... I have the luxury to not need to eat it. I think that's a solution that's going to be there for inner city production where land price is so high, it has to go up. Mm. But it's not the future I'm looking for or interested in. Because if we took all the surrounding land of big cities and had lots of small production units doing the sorts of things that we do that are all modular and scalable, Mm -hmm. then we would have no need for anyone to have ever started investing in this kind of idea. Because whatever way you look at it, it's a reductionist compartmentalized system. And there's no way you can grow, grow a complete nutritious product if it's not growing naturally as it's evolved to. Now you mm -hmm. could argue, well, we can put all kinds of nutrient stimulation things in there. It's like, well, where's that coming from? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's another one of these things. If you do the whole cost accounting, it doesn't strike me as a good idea. And it strikes me that it's unnecessary in that we don't need more concentrated farms. We need more people concentrating on farming. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to have people demonstrating a bit like what we've been doing here, that young people, yes, there is a life out here that you could live in a community of people that are caring and interested in the world around them and you can make a good living doing meaningful things and what a beautiful environment to raise a family absolutely yeah i mean and for so, your family it's amazing i mean growing up with the animals and their nature you know really really cool <laughs> so i'd say like those solutions are you know 
I'm not, I don't want to bash them too much. No. It's important people look at solutions, but to then do full cost accounting at what that actually means. But mm. I'd much rather put my focus on training young people who can move out to the edge of the city and grow food mm. for the local people there. Mm. And yeah. if you scale it and get into the mathematics of it, Sweden could easily produce its food itself. So mm. I'd like to see more of that happening here, but I'm mm. not interested in, in intensive capital and technology based farming because it's, it's not the solution that I think will feed us in the future. Okay. Uh, so the last question then is, it seems to me that you're kind of going back to the roots, how it was before factory farming. Like if I would imagine a farm like two, 200 years ago in Sweden, like fairly big size at that time, uh, like, are you going back to those methods or, or is it like a lot of new technologies involved or is it like a com combination of those two? <coughs> Sorry. I wouldn't say it's going backwards. I would say it's utilizing the natural ecosystem processes that have always been here for millions of years mm. and applying smart management and tools, appropriate scale tools to them. Like we have these incredible hand tools for our market garden that have come out in the last few years that, that just 10x your work, you know, mm. but they cost a few hundred euros each as opposed to a 50,000 euro tractor that sits still for 95% of its time and then damages the ground every time it does move you know so we're working at a human scale mm. and everything we farm scales and it's very easy for us to expand and grow and integrate more and more people into the business who could keep growing it out sideways and forwards and backwards I don't think it smacks the same as, you know, on one level, the sorts of diverse things going on at our farm with tree crops and annual vegetables and animals is very reminiscent of what all old farms were for the last 10,000 years. You can read yeah. Cato and Plato's accounts of farming in the Mediterranean 3,000 years ago in their books, and, and they describe how to build a farm. And in mm. one level, there's the same things going on. But if you cast your, your imagination back to that time, they were probably subsistence farmers at that time. They weren't driving hundreds of thousands of euros off of tiny space in a few months of production. Mm. And so that's a very big difference. Mm. And we do that through advancing science and understanding, advancing tools appropriate for human scale agriculture, and really well planned out economy and business. Mm. Farmers haven't usually been trained in business very well, mm. you know, and yeah, don't yeah. keep good records. But we spend a lot of time in our winter downtime planning and making very clear business plans like you would in any other type of business. Mm. And so it's not a surprise that our hard work pays off because we planned it to pay off. Yeah, no, I mean, you said that you had, uh, you're an entrepreneur and you had done many businesses before. And when I would listen to some of your interviews, you were talking about cash flow and all this. So, which shows that, I mean, cash flow is always a problem for small business owners. And so. Uh, it's particularly a problem for farms where yeah. you have all your costs up front and your product isn't usually there to sell mm. in till the end mm. of the year. So, actually, what we're doing at our farm, and if people listening are, are primarily interested in entrepreneurialism it's interesting to look at our farm because we've specifically chosen enterprises that you can pay off your investments and make profit in the first year because mm. they're the things that young people coming into this need to focus on because yeah, um, you can't afford to set up debt-based ag and if mm. you go to agriculture school today they teach you to make plans that will lose money for a decade or more and that's crappy business whatever way you look at it mm. so it's actually often the folks that are not coming from a farming background who are coming from the city with a desire to do something more integrated and more fulfilling who mm. come with that kind of thinking and mindset already and often with a bit of business experience and they can excel in this field mm. so. I mean, I, I think technology, I, I talk about how technology can be used for good, for good and bad. And a good way for you guys to use technology is these Facebook groups where you can sell directly to the consumer. You cut out the middleman and then 
is good for everyone, you know. It's an excellent way of using technology. Uh, another story that we heard a, a Chinese uh, high-end chicken farmer, he had uh, step counters on their chickens. So the, the, the rich Chinese consumer could see how many steps the chicken had taken before he was slaughtered. So there are many <laughs> things that can be done. And I, you work with drones as well, huh? You have drones on your farm, or do you use drones for different things? Yes, well, I use, I mean, I'm, not, I'm totally not anti-technology in any way. I'm up for using the right level of technology for what we're doing. Mm. You know, when, when I've been talking about technology, it's like big ag is, you, you know, working with machinery that you need a PhD and a laptop just to turn it on. Like modern tractors are autonomous and the, the level of investment in that infrastructure is, you know, mm. a modern tractor costs more than our farm, but our farm turns over hundreds of thousands of euros every year and gets mm. better. Mm. That tractor is depreciating. So it's, it's all like this old perspective of business and technology compared to like a classic example. I'm going off on a tangent, but it's relevant to the uh, economy and entrepreneurism. It's the year that we started our farm, a milk farm started down the road. They put 10 million euros into a milk farm in a country where dairies are shutting down every single day. Mm. They have cows that have the highest level of milk production possible but they're not evolved for our climate. So they have to heat this huge barn all winter. The cows never go outside. They stand on concrete, which they didn't evolve to do. They bring all the food to the animals with very expensive machines that cost a lot of money and diesel to run. And they feed them a load of grain, which that cow didn't evolve to eat, mm. which makes milk that's not so great for humans. But their business earns this much. So the bank loves it. Mm. and they've loaned them the money it costs them this much to produce that much so in mm. traditional terms that's good business my little farm produces only that much but it costs me nothing mm -hmm. to produce okay. that Interesting. and so i have a much better business you know i can employ double the people that are on that other farm which is 300 hectares on my little 10 hectares mm. and i feel i know all of my customers by relationship they just sell to Arla mm, and it yeah. probably leaves the country or turns into something mm. yeah, they have no idea about. We have Arla milk here in Dubai, so they fly. Maybe there those cows, <laughs> cows are flown all and the And this way is here. the level of disconnection in the production chain is yeah. those farmers go to the store and buy milk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that doesn't that's, make sense. Yeah. That's how far it's all gone wrong. Yeah. And in Stockholm, everyone I is thinking oat milk. <laughs> Yeah, well, that don't even get me started. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much for taking the time, Richard. I really appreciate it. And I recommend all the listeners to follow Richard on Instagram to see the farm life and what you're doing. And for those that want to start to farm, you can uh, buy the books and uh, yeah, start with following the YouTube channel. And there's a lot of resources there, right? So uh, what is the plan now for the rest of the day? Are you, what, is, what are you doing? I have interviews farm? today. Uh, okay. Well, we have... We've just done a big uh, work organization and I am taking on an evening shift because I'm doing interviews with some of our previous students and ah, okay. listening okay. about their farms. So ah, okay, I have okay, my afternoon full of that. Okay. So I'm, I'm doing farm work and my other uh, educational work at the moment. So it's a bit a more... Modern entrepreneur. You're not just a farmer, you're a, a modern entrepreneur, I think. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much.